Hebrews chapter 6. This thing feels so small up here. <laughs> the same one I had last week, but I, just, I guess I just have to get used to it. I look like I've shrunk. I need to shrink. That's a good thing. <laughs> All right, Hebrews chapter 6. So, as we continue into chapter 6, so we, we've seen, you know, already we know that uh, the writer of Hebrews is writing to these Hebrew believers that are tempted to go back into Judaism. And, and, and so, uh, we see as we go into chapter 6 that verse 1 as we've said, is the theme for the book of Hebrews. And so as we get into this, we see uh, he tells these Hebrew believers, go on unto perfection. This has been the whole idea that he's been trying to get them to understand. He's wanting them to realize, as I said, what they have in Christ and how that if they go back to Judaism, look at what you're going to miss. Look at, I mean, just the amazingness of Christ. We went through several lessons on on how Christ was greater than the angels and Christ was uh, greater than, than the, the earthly priests that they had and just so many different lessons that he'd been teaching them and trying to get them to understand that going back, you're losing. You know, go forward, move forward. It's time to grow. And again, the writer here is, is reminding them of the fact that, that Christ is greater than anything that they had or ever could have uh, in, in Judaism, and he's telling them to draw closer to Christ. And uh, because of that, you know, that, that again is our theme, going on into perfection. But in, in this chapter, he just takes some time to kind of stop and remind them of a few things that maybe they've lost sight of. And as I was studying for this, I realized that, you know, sometimes we look at the Bible and we look at a book like Hebrews. And it's, it's easy to say, well, that's written to Hebrew believers who are tempted to go back to Judaism. That's not for me. You know, I, there's nothing in there for me. But there's a lot in there for us. And, and that's why it's in the Bible. Because God knows that there are lessons here that you and I need. And just like these Hebrew believers, a lot of these lessons that the writer's teaching them are things that we need to be reminded of as well. And so as we look at this today, just kind of open your heart and open your mind to the, the truth of God's Word and, and maybe be reminded of some truths that we've let slip, all right? So first of all, we see that he reminds them here of, of an earnest teacher. Uh, beginning in verse 1, he says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Now, stop there for just a minute. As I was, as I was studying this, you know, that, that first phrase there really catches your attention. He says, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. So, what's he telling them? Because if he's telling them to draw closer to Christ, why is he telling them to leave these principles it all, it's almost as if he's saying, forget that stuff. But that's not what he's saying. What he's saying here is it's time to move from these basics. Okay, this is, this is what he's trying to get them to understand. These principles that you've been following, these, these principles of the doctrines of Christ, you're, you're kind of stuck here. It's like, you ever seen someone that... that uh, maybe you went soul winning or maybe talked to a family member and they get saved and they're happy that they got saved and, and maybe there's some changes in their lives, but they never really grow. You know, there's, there's never a time of discipleship. There's never a time where they really plug into a church and, and get involved and there never seems to be any spiritual growth in their life. They're just kind of stuck in one spot. That's what he's telling them here. You're stuck in these, these basics. You know, he's not telling them to leave that truth behind. He's saying, move on. You know, kind of like he told them in chapter 5, you know, get off the milk and let's move on to some meat. 
While the milk is good, and these doctrines are good, but there's so much more to your salvation that you're missing because you're not trying to grow, all right? So that's what he's saying there. He's not saying to, to leave that truth behind. He's saying just move forward and let's carry that with you. And then he goes on, he says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. He's saying, we're not going to go over that and rehash that. You know, we're not going to constantly live in the same spot. You know, you're just, you're not moving. You're stuck. All right, verse 2. Verse 2, he says, of the doctrine of baptism and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. So, he again, these are not bad things to know. He's just reminding them, you know these truths. You know, how many times does someone get saved and one of their biggest struggles, and, and, and I don't understand why this is, but it seems to be that when someone gets saved, the hardest thing for them to do is take that next step of baptism, right? But again, many people, they take that step and that's where they stay. So again, this is what he's telling them. You know all these truths. You know all these doctrines. You know you know salvation. You know baptism. You, you know uh, you, the resurrection of the dead. You know eternal judgment. You know these truths. All right, let's move on. You ever have, and I think most of us in here have, if not all of us, you know, young children, and maybe you're walking down a hallway, you know, and what do you have to do with a young child? Come on. Come on. Keep moving. All right, catch up. Come on. Until you finally have to go back and grab their hand. You stay up here with me, right? Because what are they prone to do? Wander off. You know, I mean, they're, they're still your child, and you're going to go after them, and you're going to grab them, and you're going to pull them. But if you don't, they're just going to wander off, right? That's what they're doing. They're just kind of stuck. They're in this zone of, what do I do now? Well, he's telling them, I'm your teacher. I'm going to help you, right? I'm going to help you along. Look at verse 3. He says, and this will we do if God permit. All right, he, he's, he's telling them, I'm, I'm going to earnestly teach you, God willing, what you need to learn as you move forward. But let's get out of this stalemate, if you will. So the first three verses there, that's all he's saying to them is, listen, I know you know these things. I understand that you know the truth of salvation. You, you know the truth of baptism, but there's more to it. Let's get moving. All right, so he's just kind of prodding them along, and he's just trying to say, let me take your hand, and, and God willing, I'm going to get you through this. Sometimes we have to do that with people, don't we? Sometimes we just have to take someone under our wing, so to speak, and just disciple them. My wife and I were fortunate to be a part of the discipleship program in our church in Florida. And, and I can remember when the pastor came and asked us, you know, we, sure, we'd love to do that. And it just, it amazed me because God put this all together. There's only, there's no other way it happened like this. So he asked us to be disciples, and, or disciplers, if you will. And uh, so we start this program, and the first night he says, I'm going to send you this couple. They've really been struggling, and, and I think you guys are a perfect fit for them. Well, they come into the class, and we start talking to them, and, and, and you could just see his countenance. He was just not happy. He did not want to be there. He didn't want anything to do with this. It's almost like he was there just because she made him come. You know, and that was the impression that you got. So we got to talking to him, and I got talking to him, and I said, well, now, where are you from originally? Because nobody's really from Florida, right? Kind of like Tennessee. And uh, he said, well, I'm from a place you've probably never heard of. I'm from Richmond, Indiana. I said, really? My mom grew up there. I'm from Union City, just a few miles. He's, and his whole countenance changed. And, and it was just like, wow, you know the, and, and we started talking about different places in Richmond and started talking about the area, and it just opened him up. And his entire world changed. 
it, his mindset changed, his countenance changed, and we were able to disciple them, and they became faithful members of the church. And I mean, he was cooking dinners for the men's meals, and I just jumped in and got involved. And now, I'm not saying that we did that. But sometimes, as a child of God, when we see someone that needs help, we need to jump in and help. And God will put someone in your path that is perfect for you because of your past, and you're going to be able to help them. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. He's saying, I'm going to help you through this. I'm going to guide you along. But, you know, God willing, we can do this because it's going to be a battle. Because they're just so stuck in their old ways that, man, they, they want Judaism for some reason. And he's just reminding them, listen, what you have in Christ is so much greater. Let me help you see that. So he's saying there, I'm going to be an earnest teacher. And then next we see an exceptional truth. Now, now this is amazing to me because I sometimes have to be reminded of this. And I think all of us sometimes need to be reminded of this. So he begins in the next few verses to remind them of this exceptional truth of what they have. And, and I, just, I just want you to see this. Look at verse 4. For it is, what's that next word? Impossible for those who were once enlightened to have tasted of the heavenly, and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Now, now, hold on, let's just stop there for just a second. I want to break this down before we get on to what he's teaching them. I want you to see the truths that he's laying out here. So he's saying it's impossible for those who have been enlightened. Okay, so who's the light of the world? Jesus Christ. So it's impossible for those that have experienced his light You've come to the light of Christ, okay? He's saying it's impossible for those that have been enlightened. It's impossible for those who have tasted the heavenly gift. Or in other words, that gift of eternal life. So we know we're saved. We know we have eternal life. We, we, we know it's settled in heaven. It's impossible to have been partakers of the Holy Spirit. So when we get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside us. You see, he's laying out these truths, okay? It's impossible, he says, for those that have tasted or experienced the word of God and the power of the world to come. So you've experienced the word of God. You've, you've enabled the word of God to change your life. Have you ever been reading the scripture and go, man, that's exactly what I need for today? That's what he's talking about. You've experienced that. And the power of the world to come. So you understand heaven and you understand the hope of heaven. So, so these truths that he's reminding them of, he goes back, he says, it's impossible in verse 6, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. All right, now, this sounds like he's talking about someone losing their salvation. But it, this term, fall away, it's not saying that they're losing their salvation. They're falling away from these truths. And he's saying it's impossible for someone that has experienced all of these things to have to get saved again. You can't crucify Christ all over again. That's what he's telling them here. You can't crucify Christ anew because he's already been crucified. So it's not as if you can lose your salvation and have to get saved again. What he's saying is if you can fall away from this truth, listen, it's impossible for you to have to get saved again because the truth of the matter is it's impossible for you to fall away from this truth. That's what he's trying to get them to understand. If you have truly experienced these truths that he's just laid out, it's impossible for you to get away from them because they have a hold of you. Now, let me just kind of explain this a little better. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit of God comes to live inside you, right? We all understand that. You cannot escape the Holy Spirit of God, period. 
and I can testify to that in my own life. There was a time shortly after I got saved that I, I ran from the call to preach, and I said, I, I, I don't want that in my life. That, that scared me to death, and, and I was what we call backslidden for quite a bit of time. I mean, a long time I was backslidden. But every time I tried to go back to that old lifestyle, every time I went to my old friends and tried to do the things we used to do, every single time without fail, the Holy Spirit beat me up. And I knew I couldn't be there. I knew I couldn't do that. I knew I could not do these things that I used to do. The Holy Spirit wouldn't allow me to do it. I have personally experienced that. And that's what the writer is saying. It's impossible. You don't understand what you have. I mean, this is an exceptional truth. If you have truly experienced these things, it's impossible to fall away. Now, we can fail. We can, we can even quit on God. But the Holy Spirit's going to just eat us alive until we come back. Or our hearts get hardened. Because the truth of the matter is, once you belong to God, you belong to God. You know, God is not what we used to call as children an Indian giver. Not to offend anybody, but he's not. He doesn't change his mind. In fact, in my backslidden state, it was Romans 11.29 that brought me back to God. Because as I was, you know, let me just say this. One of the dumbest things for a backslidden Christian to do is read their Bible. Because I couldn't get away from it. I had created such a habit of reading my Bible that even in a backslidden state, I would read my Bible, if that makes any sense. And I came across Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, where it says, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So God never changes his mind. And God still loved me, and God still cared about me, and God still had a plan for my life, and guess what? I had to get back to God. And it was that verse that changed my thinking, and realized, man, I can't get away from him. And that's what the writer's saying here. Uh, Christ was crucified once for your sin. You're not going to crucify him again. You're not going to get re-saved. You know, if you've really experienced these truths, then you can't get away from it. Your life has changed. Everything about you has changed. And once you experience that truth, it's amazing how much it changes everything else. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, when you experience these truths of God and you experience this, this relationship with Christ, it changes the way you look at everything. It changes the way you look at media. It changes the way you look at entertainment. It changes the way you look at individuals. It changes the way you look at life, period. And what he's saying is this, this truth is so good and it is so real that once you've tasted it, you can't stop. What an amazing truth. And, and, and as I read that, I just thought, man, that, that's it. That, I mean, that's, that's the Christian life. Once you experience this difference in what it's like to live for Christ, there is no other life. Have you ever looked at someone that's living without Christ and thought, how do they not see what they're doing is, is wicked and wrong? And how, are, how can they live like that? They've never experienced the truth. They don't know the difference. They don't want to sometimes. And once you experience it, man, it is life-changing. So he, he's reminding these Hebrew believers, you, you have this exceptional truth. That, that God loves you and God wants to guide you and God wants to protect you and God is going to give you these blessings. And, and I'm going to be your teacher. I'm going I'm to be I'm going to be there the whole time and, and I'm going to I'm going to do everything that I can to teach you these truths. And I want you to understand how much you have in Christ. All right. So moving on in verse seven, moving on in verse seven, he says with this. He's reminding them that there comes an evident 
toil. I know some big words, okay? Now, verse 7, he says, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. So right there in verse 7, he says, Now, when the earth receives the rain, all right, so God sends the rain upon the earth, all the earth, and when the earth drinks in that rain, what does it do? It produces fruit, or it gives off a product of some type that can be used or can be a benefit for, the, for those that are caring for it. So if you're a farmer, or if you have a garden in your backyard, and you know the, the, the earth takes in that rain and it produces something for you because you have taken care of it. This is the picture that he's giving them here. All right, so, so this evident toil, so that the earth is obviously working because of the blessing that it has received from God. You see the picture he's giving them? All right, in verse 8. In verse 8 he says, But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. He says, But if what the earth produces is not useful... It's burned up as waste. All right, so he's saying, you know, we can work all day long and produce nothing. Just wasted time. Or we can work and we can produce things that are beneficial to the service of God. So this is a picture that he's trying to get to them. That, you know, th there's, there's an evidence of who you're working for when you're working. You know, all of us should be working for Christ. If you're a child of God, everything that you do should be for the benefit of the cause of Christ. And I realize that, you know, as he's using this example, they might be scratching their heads like we scratch our heads and go, what? The earth? The rain? Huh? What it's saying here is you get out what you put in. If blessing's coming in, then blessing needs to go out. So God's blessing the earth with the rain and so the earth is blessing those that care for it with a product that they can use. You getting the picture here? I hope it's making sense. <laughs> All right, so verse 9. Verse 9, he says, But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. So he's saying here, when, when we receive salvation, our lives should then produce fruit that is beneficial for the kingdom of God. So he's saying you need to continue to serve him. You need to continue to do everything that you can to bring glory and honor to God who saved you because he's worthy. So he's the one that's blessing you. He's the one that's taking care of you. He's the one that is guiding you. And so your life and your labor should reflect that. It's a simple truth that he's trying to get him here. There's an evident toil. There's evidence of who you belong to as you work. So he's saying here, this labor should continue for him until you see him. So don't stop working for Christ. Again, don't go back to Judaism. What you have in Christ is greater, so work for him. Work towards him. Go on unto perfection because Christ is where that perfection is found. And so he's, he's encouraging them to to do the work that they know they should be doing, work for Christ, and work for the blessings that God is going to give them. All right? Finally, he says, there's also an enduring testimony. An enduring testimony. Beginning in verse 12, he says, that ye be not, a sh not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises for when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. Notice here that, that we have the promise of God 
And those promises tell us that God's going to take care of us. God's going to provide. You know, as we serve him, as we work for him, he's going to give us everything that we need. And he's saying that, that because God has no equal and God has no superior, then he can only swear this promise by his own name. And God is not going to shame his own name. So we can trust his promises. We can trust he's going to take care of us. We can trust his testimony. That's what he's saying here. Just like he promised Abraham. And Abraham received the blessing that God promised him. Look at verse 14. Verse 14, it says, Saying, Surely, blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. So he's, again, talking about Abraham here. So he promised Abraham that his, his seed would be innumerable. He promised Abraham a son, didn't he? And Abraham was 99 years old at the time of the promise. But it says, and then he patiently endured. So it's not as if he was questioning God. He was doubting God. He just served God, and then God provided. Now, we know the story of Abraham. We know what happened. You know, Sarah brought her handmaid in, and they had Ishmael and the whole mess with that, and we're still fighting that mess today. People don't realize that, but we are. And so even with that, even though Abraham tried to get the blessing himself, God was still faithful. God still provided what he said he would provide. And Abraham and Sarah had a son in their old age. And so we, we know that story. And, and so we, we know as he's using this example here, he's saying, you know the faithfulness of God. You know that you can, you can hold to his promises. You know that he's not going to fail you. And here's the example. You know God's testimony. And you cannot deny it. Verse 16. He says, For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. So he's saying here that, that God, you know, as he says, you know, men, the way men work, you know, they, they, they make a deal, they make an agreement, and they settle it by an oath. All right? So I'm going to maybe a contract or something. I'm going to make a vow to you that this is going to happen. And that settles it. Right? That's what he's saying here. But God wanting to settle our hearts and settle and confirm his promise in our hearts, he says, I'm making a commitment to you that you can trust my promises. Now, again, the promise that he's referring to in all of this is the promise of salvation. That's what he's talking to them about. We can trust this promise. We can trust God's promise because Christ was proof of the oath. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, he says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into, uh, it, sorry, which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, even though I butchered those verses, <laughs> well, what he's saying here is we can trust the promises of God because Christ was proof of that oath that God made to us. Christ came born of a virgin, born pure, born holy, born sinless, lived a sinless life, died for our sins, and then, as we said last time, not only was he the high priest, he was also the spotless lamb, and carried his blood, it says here in verse 19, within the veil. So again, giving us that example of that Old Testament tabernacle, and the, the high priest being the only one allowed to enter that veil, 
the only one allowed into the Holy of Holies, Christ entered in with his blood and he laid that blood on the mercy seat before God, which then enabled what? Us to go. He gave us the power to enter into the very presence of God. And we know this because this is God's testimony that he cannot lie. There's no way it is impossible for God to lie so we can trust his testimony. We can trust what he's done. We can trust what he's going to do. We can trust him with everything. And then again in verse 20, he makes that phrase, made in high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And as I said, we're going to get into Melchizedek later, but what did we say about Melchizedek before? His priesthood was perpetual. It was forever. It was never ending. So Christ was made this high priest forever. Christ never changes. Christ will always be our high priest, which means Christ is always there in the presence of God, always there to intercede for us, always there to help provide anything that we need, and we have access to God through Christ. But that's the only way we have access. There's not a man in this world that can give you access to God. There's not a church in this world that can give you access to God. There's not a religion in this world that can give you access to God. Only Christ can do that. So can you imagine, as, as the writer is, and, and the writer's laying this out for these Hebrew believers, and they want to go back to their old ways. They want to go back to Judaism. They want to go back to the law. They want to go back to temple worship. They want to go back to all of these, these rudiments and these, these, these structured religious sacraments, if you will. And he's saying, you don't understand what you have in Christ. All of those things that you used to do, all of that ritualism, that has done nothing to purify you. That has done nothing to save you. That has done nothing to give you access to God. But with Christ, you have full and complete and unfettered access to God. You can come to God at any time with anything and he will hear you because you're coming through the high priest, Jesus Christ. Man. And, and, and because God can't lie, we can believe that. We can trust that. That's our hope. And so these Hebrew believers, they had to be reminded of this. Now, I don't know exactly what's going on at this time in this age. But we know that throughout history, Christians have been persecuted. Christians have had difficult times. And, and especially back during Bible times, you know, when, when, when Jesus came and set up his earthly ministry, all of the disciples thought, oh, now's the time you're going to set up your kingdom and, and you're going to eliminate Rome. You know, they, they thought our oppressors are going to be gone, right? But that wasn't the case. And so, yes, there was some oppression for them. The Romans hated the Christians. In fact, Herod, one of their most, most wicked rulers, used to burn Christians to light his, his barbecues. I mean, they'd put them on stakes and they'd set them on fire and they would eat dinner while they were burning. I mean, it was just wicked, a terrible time to be a Christian. So what's going on here with these Hebrew believers that, you know, maybe they're being persecuted. Maybe they're going through hard times. Maybe they're going through trials and they're saying, man, I, I had it so much easier in Judaism. I had it so much easier in my old life. I didn't have people hating me. I didn't have people persecuting me. And, and sometimes we feel like that, don't we? You know, when, when, you, when you go to a restaurant and, and you eat dinner with your family in a restaurant and bow your head to pray, do you notice the looks? We were, we were in, a, in, a, in Gatlinburg in a waffle house, or not a waffle house, but a pancake house. And <laughs> we don't go to waffle house. <laughs> but, but we're sitting at a pancake house, and, and, and we bowed our heads, and we prayed, and, and a lady from another table walked over, and she said, I just want to thank you for that. She said, that's something that's missing in our society, to see families that pray together. And she was just, she was amazed. 
And, you know, we, we have incidents like that, and we say, well, yeah, it's good to be a Christian, you know, but when the snickers come and the finger pointing and, you know, the criticisms, it's not always easy to be a Christian, is it? And sometimes, you know, not all of us are blessed to work in ministry. Not all of us are blessed to work with Christians. You know, sometimes when you work in the world and, and you work a secular job and, and you're trying hard to be a Christian and nobody at work is. You know, I've been there. It's not fun. It's not easy. And you're trying to have a good testimony and they're making fun of you and they're criticizing you every single day. And man, it's just so much easier just to be like them. So there's always a temptation. And maybe that's what these Hebrew believers were facing. The same difficulties that you and I face every day. And the temptation to just give up and to quit and say, man, it's just easier if I'm not doing this Christian thing. No, let us go on unto perfection. Push through the trials and endure the difficulties and just trust Christ. And just say, what I have in Christ is greater than anything the world could offer me. How could I give that up? And just like I said when I was living in that backslidden state, every time I tried to do something that my old self would have done, the Holy Spirit said, no, you can't do that. And it was the hardest time in my life. And I'll say this, and I believe this wholeheartedly. The most miserable people in this world are backslidden Christians. Now, I know there's a lot of misery in the world. Don't get me wrong. And, and I know there are a lot of people that are unsaved, that have difficult times and have hardships and have, have misery in their life. But a child of God that is running from God is more miserable than any of them because they're being pulled in two different directions. And until you give in to the right direction, your life is nothing but misery. But I'm thankful. I'm so thankful that God says, I still love you. Just come back to me. I'm still here. And you can reach me. And I can still help you and still change your life. Man, and I'm sure we'll see at the end of this that the Hebrew believers said, okay, Christ is better. I agree. Let's get back to it. Let's get to work. But we'll have to wait and see, won't we? <laughs> the truth of the matter is we will not reach perfection in this life. And I know the whole theme here is a path to perfection and moving on to perfection. But Christ is the only perfect person in the world. And so we can't have perfection without Christ. And we can't have perfection this side of heaven. It's not a license to sin, but we should be always striving to be more Christ-like every day. And when we get to heaven and experience his true perfection, then we'll realize how far off the mark we were. Man. You know, I think, I think a lot of times we, we make the mistake of, and the Bible talks about this, comparing ourselves among ourselves. You know, oh, well, he's more spiritual, or oh, no, he's not as spiritual, and no, they do this, and they're terrible people. No. We all have our imperfections. But we all need to be drawing closer to Christ every day. And we all need to be seeking his will and his way in our lives daily. That's the only way that we can experience this true blessing that the Hebrew writer is trying to get these people to experience. So just trust Christ and understand that whatever he has for you is always better than anything that the world could ever offer. Amen. Father, we thank you for this time and thank you for these truths that have been laid out in your word and just pray that we can take these truths and apply them to our lives and help us, God, to learn every single day to draw closer to you and to be more Christ-like in everything that we say, do, and think. 
Father, we love you and pray that you be with the services to follow. Be with Pastor as he brings the message this morning. May it be exactly what we need for our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.